the word of the Lord. So now we get to do something fun. I need somebody to take a birthday church. And we all need to grab a palm. Can we do that? Can you guys come up and take
everyone who donated to the Salt and Bach uh, project that we did. And uh, we collected 128 pairs of socks and uh, four pairs of knits and two scarves. And uh, Jean Davis, I dropped them off this morning, and she was very appreciative of all the generosity. So it's
freedom of God's deliverance. Every year, if not every day, the Jews remember that they were once slaves, and God delivered them, and will again someday. It commemorates the story of the Exodus, and it is one of the holiest holidays of the Jewish tradition. The Roman Empire did not celebrate this festival. They tolerated it. And they tolerated it with heavy military presence. Pontius Pilate riding a military horse, surrounded by marching armies and blowing standards of imperial power, rode in through the front gates of Jerusalem. Now make no mistake, it says, Rome is here, and Rome is in charge. Pilate represented Caesar, and Caesar was clear, I am divine, and I am the ruler of the universe. And as for your festival of freedom, we will tell you what freedom is. And meanwhile, at the back gate, Jesus on a donkey rode into Jerusalem, as the palms were waved, and some people cheered and sang, death was circling. Suffering was gathering. The hurt by the suffering, we are not told why the righteous suffer in this story, only that they do. Only that there is something profound in the faithfulness to God that allows us to carry on. See, so much has happened over the last few years with Jesus walking from one place to another, telling his story, lifting people up, healing that welcomes people home, encouragement that helps people to stand up and carry on their way, stand up to injustice, to unbearable poverty, to violence, hate, and to fear. Then, like yesterday, just as supper was starting, a woman interrupted. In the middle of the meal, she bent low and anointed Jesus' feet, a gesture used in preparation for death. And no one said a word until someone interrupted and went on about how that money could have been used for something better, something for the poor. But that sweet smell of the perfume lingered. And Judas, he disappeared. He was off making deals of death in the shadows for money. Thirty pieces of silver that four months wasted <coughs> were traded for a life. And after the meal, Jesus took bread into the room and the disciples with their full bellies, he broke it and said, this is my body. And then taking the cup, he said, this is the blood of the covenant. Every time you gather, do this in remembrance of me. And no one asked, and he did not explain. And the group, those twelve, they left the table seeing and walked up the hill where they nestled among the trees in the Mount of Olives, overlooking the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus, he withdraws. He takes a minute away from the group and bends low in prayer. And he prays, take this cup from me. If it is your will, take it. Your will be done. <coughs> and he gives himself over. Jesus asks to be spared, like we all would ask to be spared in a time where we would face our imminent death. Why would we ask to be spared? God created us free, but God does not spare us from this suffering, not even Jesus. And as he prayed, the disciples fell asleep. 
and in the quiet rustling. The dark sky suddenly filled with flames flickering on the ends of torches, and terror filled the hearts of the group. Their hearts pounding as Judas led the mob of people that surrounded them. Swords and clubs emerged ready to do battle at the first hint of resistance. And the high priest slave had his ear cut off, and as quickly as it had been torn off in anger, Jesus healed him in love. Violence and revenge are not our way, he said. And as Judas approached him, standing eye to eye and heart to heart, without saying a word, Judas leaned in, a kiss. And as his lips left Jesus' cheek, all that could be heard was the disciples' feet in plea. Jesus' cheek abandoned. As the disciples disappeared into their night, their sandals flapping on the ground, the thunder of their abandonment, running with all their might, left Jesus alone. And it appeared that Caesar was winning, and death was approaching. Betrayed, alone, and in chains, Jesus stood before the high priest, are you Christ? He asked. Silence. And outside the palace, Peter was beside a warming fire. He was so close, and yet so far away. And the serving maid broke the silence. He was with the prisoner. And Peter says, I, I don't know him. And the cock crowed. In the morning, Jesus was dragged before Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? He mocked. You say that I am, answered Jesus. Pilate, whose aspirations were for position and status in Rome, and not this backwater town of Jerusalem, he saw through these accusations and said, Let me release Barbarus instead. For us a zealot, one who would violently fight for Israel's freedom stood beside Jesus. Jesus, who said that Israel, the world, would be free only through nonviolence, justice, and love. It was obvious who Rome wanted to release. They know how to deal with violence. They could take care of Barabbas quickly. They did not know what to do with someone like Jesus. And there a small crowd roared. As much as a small crowd can roar. Set Barabbas free. And Pilate abdicated his responsibility. His silence deafening. Crucify him. Their voices carried to the highest heaven in the very depth of creation. Pilate plunged his hands into a bowl of water, holding them high to see that they, that he had no part in this. He had no part in the crucifixion of Christ. The soldiers beat Jesus. They mocked him. They dressed him in purple. Ramming a crown of thorns on his head, they dragged him back along that old dusty road that led Jesus into this place. And only this time with a heavy beam of wood on his back. He stumbled along the way. The only sound that could be heard was the groaning of his body. The groaning of all creation. The grim parade towards death dragged out for all to see clearly giving the message, Caesar has won, and soon death will greet you. Simon was pulled out of the crowd to help carry the cross, Jesus stumbling 
along. And the sky grew darker by the minute. Secured to the cross, Jesus was lifted up and dropped into place. There, between two robbers, was Jesus of Nazareth, a sign above his head that declared he was the king of the Jews. Jesus hung there, exposed, humiliated. The pain and close suffocation, dying in shame, naked, executed as a criminal by the Roman authorities. Jesus, the one who taught us about the kingdom of heaven, the one who healed the sick, shared his bread, who forgave sins and welcomed everyone to his table. Jesus, the one who drew a line in the sand for those too eager to judge, who told us to resist violence, the violence of our words, our actions, our pride. Jesus, who taught us about humility, serving, and loving, was nearing the end. For three hours, Jesus hung on that cross in the thin place between life and death. The crowd continuing to taunt, the soldiers to mock. Some even wanted him to live just a little bit longer to see if God would come down and rescue him. But there would be no dramatic rescue on that day. You can imagine Jesus singing the 23rd, 22nd, and 24th Psalms, the words he learned as a boy. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yea, though I will walk through the valley of the shadow, lift up your head, the King of glory is coming. And in an instant, everyone 
knowing that God's love meets us here as we wait together. Amen.